business theorists have studied competition for decades, and they've come to some robust conclusions about how we compete and what factors compel us to compete the way we do. That's the topic of this lecture, the main types of business strategies. Our objective is to learn the major ways that firms and people compete economically with each other and how these modes of competition also apply across non-business activity. We also learn how to use this knowledge so that we might compete more effectively by obtaining what we call a competitive advantage. After this lecture, you should have a much better idea of how to position your business and position yourself successfully in competitive situations of all kinds. First, we look at the two main ways that businesses compete in the marketplace. This is your basic choice, what we call differentiation or cost leadership. Think of these two strategic thrusts as umbrellas, and we move freely under one or the other. Under these two big umbrellas, differentiation or cost leadership, we can do many things, many different things. We can, can apply tactics. We can focus on different parts of our value chain. We can joust with our opponents in shrewd ways. We can focus on a particular segment of a market. We can concentrate our resources in special and unique ways. But always, we find ourselves traveling in one of two directions, differentiation or cost leadership. Now, Michael Porter introduced this quite brilliant categorization back in 1980 in a classic work called Competitive Strategy. Let's have a look. First, let's have a look at cost leadership. And this is sometimes called the low-cost strategy. The objective of this strategy is to sell our products and services at the lowest price that the market will bear and make our profits on volume. We find ways to cut our costs and to attract value-conscious customers. Our target customers are motivated primarily by low prices. They usually don't have much loyalty to our brand, or any brand for that matter, they'll switch to a lower price product immediately. Now, if we produce a commodity such as crude oil, we're almost locked into this strategy. Commodities are difficult to differentiate. We can't attract more customers or charge higher prices by packaging our crude oil in colorful barrels or giving it a catchy brand name or by hiring Michael Jordan for our advertisements. Here's an example of the low-cost strategy in action. Most of us are familiar with the big box retailer, Walmart. Now, this company is one of the great icons of American capitalist success. With 6,000 stores and more than $250 billion in annual sales, Walmart is the world's largest retailer. Now, Walmart has pursued almost exclusively a low-cost strategy. This has been reflected in its motto for much of its history, always low prices. Walmart's brand stands for something in the minds of its customers and it has resulted from a consistent pursuit of its elegant business model. Make its profit on volume, stock its shelves in volume, and it obtains volume discounts. Squeeze its suppliers and pass the savings on to you and you enjoy everyday low prices. But our inclination is to tinker with a successful model sometimes for the better. But straying from a proven strategy without sound reasons is never a good idea. For instance, again, Walmart. Walmart has strayed from its core strategy on occasion as it tries to capture more customers. Nothing wrong with that. But this just muddies up the brand. It muddies up what people expect when they walk into the store. In 2007, Walmart shelved its 19-year-old motto and adopted a new motto, save money, live better. Now, this vague catch-all slogan was a blunder. In fact, it was one of a series of strategic blunders that decoupled Walmart from the secret of its success. Walmart wanted to attract newer middle-income customers with more buying power, but it began to alienate its base, the blue-collar workers that had served as the backbone of its success. It changed its store layout so it looked, frankly, more like a Target store. It eliminated what it thought was clutter. It dropped more than 300 popular low-price items, and prices began to creep up. The new slogan didn't work, 
And even though there was a recession on, the low price items were missing. And people, they hated the new store layout. After three years, Walmart chucked it all. And in 2011, the store brought back hundreds of items and advertised the fact in its stores with signs saying, It's back. Walmart's tinkering with its formulas stopped, at least for the moment. Walmart went back to its roots in 2011 with its slogan, low prices every day on everything. Now, another firm tinkering disastrously with a winning low price formula was the movie rental company Netflix. Netflix had begun offering DVD rental by mail and was trying to expand into on-demand internet streaming media. By early 2011, it had more than 23 million subscribers. Highly successful and blessed with phenomenal growth, Netflix in late 2011 made two incredibly bad strategic decisions. First, it arbitrarily raised its prices by 60%, and it offered a limp rationale that merely angered subscribers. Second, it split its services into two separate entities, streaming and mail order, and it set up two separate websites. As a result, Netflix lost almost one million subscribers, a discovery that Netflix commanded very little respect as a brand. Customers shopping on price left for competitors Amazon.com, Google, and Walmart, and Netflix stock dropped. The company, Netflix, immediately reversed track on the dual website idea, having learned, one believes, a valuable lesson about the importance of having and maintaining a core strategy at all times. Some products virtually demand a low-cost strategy to be used. Now, these products are called commodities. An example of product that demands a a low-cost strategy is cement. Now, cement is a commodity. It's tough to differentiate cement. You can't alter its features in meaningful ways to appeal to customers. You can't sell scented cement or sell it in colorful, individually packaged servings or sell it with a freshness date stamp or such like. And this means that cement companies compete on price. Well, this isn't pleasant. Profit margins are low and the competition is fierce. Now, let's translate the low-cost strategy to the individual person competing, say, in the job market. When people search for a job, many of them unwittingly choose a bad strategy. They pursue a low-cost strategy when they should be pursuing a differentiation strategy. Picture a, a job hunter going into an interview. She walks in with a sign around her neck that says, Hire me. I'll work for less. Now, this unfortunate soul is pursuing what is called a a low-cost strategy. It means that she is competing on price and nothing else. Her price, of course, is her salary. It means she worked longer hours for less pay. She unwittingly advertises herself as a commodity. Instead of the hard work of differentiating herself, she chooses the easy path of low-cost, slashing her salary demands. She tries to undercut her competition by offering more of the same, but for less. Now, this seems foolish, doesn't it? Why would anyone want to compete this way? Every day, low wages. And yet, many people do, especially newly minted college graduates, and even, at times, the more experienced of us. Even many professional companies fear to differentiate themselves, believing that they may lose the stray walk-in customer. Take the chiropractor, for instance. The old joke about chiropractors is that anyone with a back is a customer. Such an approach is a textbook low-cost strategy. With no differentiation between chiropractors, customers will seek out the lowest price in the market. Thus, chiropractors are at the mercy of the dictates of supply and demand. They charge what everyone else charges, maybe a bit less. But what if you're a chiropractor and you specialize in, say, Athletes, low back pain. Suddenly, your hourly rate went up. Sure, you've lost the occasional walk-by and a host of non-athletes, but every athlete with low back pain will seek you out. You have moved yourself from a commodity to a premium product. You have moved yourself from Walmart to Bloomingdale's. You have, in fact, differentiated yourself.
Now, in the realm of the military, we also find low-cost and differentiation strategies. In World War I, all armies in the conflict competed in the same way, low-cost, delivering the same product in as efficient a way as possible. Undifferentiated strategy and tactics that yielded unimaginative warfare and pointlessly bloody results. Over-the-top charges into machine gun fire and barbed wire was the norm. This is the military version of price competition. Gains are rare and losses can be heavy for both sides. It was not until almost three years had passed before one side achieved an innovative breakthrough and differentiated itself in a major way. The invention of and use of the tank broke the stalemate of trench warfare and proved to be a technological innovation that turned the tide of war. The differentiation strategy won. And the choice is not just about technology. It's also about people. Do you create special elite divisions of your best troops? Or do you spread your best troops around, hoping to raise the quality of all your divisions? In World War II, the Allies and the Axis powers each took different approaches. Germany learned the lessons of World War I, and it went for differentiation. It built numerous elite divisions and used these troops either as spearheads in offensive operations or as fire brigades in defensive operations. The United States took an egalitarian approach and spread their best troops evenly throughout the army. In the end, the U.S., defeated Germany by pursuing a high-volume strategy using many units of roughly equal quality. World War II, in turn, provided such a powerful example that many U.S. businesses after the war came to the view that low-price, high-volume was the way to compete successfully. Which brings us back to our second major strategy, differentiation. While World War II in Europe was won on a high-volume strategy, the war in Asia ended with an extreme example of differentiation, the first use of nuclear weapons. Japan was on the receiving end, and the conclusion spread after the war that differentiation is the way to win. In the United States, Harvard Business School guru Michael Porter articulated this principle, and he began pointing out, all the ways a firm can differentiate itself by providing something unique that is valuable to buyers beyond offering simply a low price. This unique difference can be thought of as a unique selling proposition, or a USP. Many firms make the common mistake of unfocusing their proposition, even to the extent that it's no longer unique. They believe, mistakenly, that ambiguity is a good thing. Why? because they believe it allows them to do more things for different types of people. And as a result, the brand is diluted until eventually it can become meaningless. Think of the many companies out there that advertise themselves as offering as their product solutions. Say what? It means absolutely nothing. Here's a simple test to show you exactly what I mean. I call this the adult bookstore test. To discover whether a slogan or a USP is tightly focused and powerful, try this. If the slogan in question could be attached equally well to Colombian Coffee, Joe's Barbershop, a software company, an airline, and an adult bookstore, then it's likely an unfocused, generic, and ineffective slogan. Exhibit A is Grolsch Beer. Grolsch Beer. This craft beer's awful long-time slogan was this. Craftsmanship is mastery. Which could refer to power tools or to the aforementioned adult bookstore. At one time, Mobile Oil used, We want you to live. Which is a nice sentiment, I suppose, but which could apply to most any business. Companies selling a commodity with nothing to differentiate it often fall back on vague slogans with no real focus. But there are also examples of superb differentiation. Let's look at two fine examples of differentiated products. Superficially, they're the same product performing the very same function. The Rolex watch and the Casio watch. Now, both Rolex and the Casio digital watch are timepieces. But do they compete in the same market space? 
No, they do not. You don't find them sold in the same stores or through the same channels. You don't see them advertised in the same media, nor will you find the same celebrities advertising them. Rolex and Casio do not compete against each other. They do not serve the same customers. In reality, the Casio and Rolex offerings are different products with different pricing. Let's look. Casio has offered great watches starting at about $14 for a basic digital watch and running to more than $450 for watches in its Pathfinder series for the serious outdoor sportsman and $500 for its Edifice smart watches. The watches are rugged and well made. For instance, Casio has offered a sports watch that takes and displays barometric pressure readings, which are then converted into altitude measurements based on international standard atmospheric values. A built-in thermo sensor gives reliable temperature readings, and it gives you the time in 48 of the world's cities. It's also waterproof down to 100 meters. This watch sold for $84. Rolex is different. At the low end of Rolex, the Oyster Perpetual Air King was around $4,600. And at the higher end, there was the Oyster Perpetual Day date. Now, compare these features of the day date with the Casio sports watch I just described. The Rolex is platinum bezel set with 42 baguette diamonds. Eight round and two baguette diamonds set on the dial. 31 joule chronometer movement. Synthetic sapphire crystal with, and I think this is ironic, with Roman numerals on the dial. The price? $71,000 for a watch using Roman numerals. Now, both watch brands are differentiated quite well. They are so differentiated, in fact, that they don't even compete against each other. Casio, it offers rugged, high-tech functionality for a reasonable price. Rolex offers true luxury for what you expect to pay for true luxury and prestige, and a message of enduring success that never goes out of style. Here's another example, and this one from the automobile industry. Let's compare two cars. If that car is Tata Nano Super Compact, it's priced under $3,000. If that car is a Lexus LS460, it's priced at $75,000. Now, that's a gap of $72,000. What constitutes this gap between the two vehicles? One vehicle is pursuing a low-cost strategy, fulfilling the basic human need for transportation. The other is pursuing a premium pricing differentiation strategy, fulfilling a host of other needs and demands that people are willing to pay for. Differentiation means specializing. It means adding attractive features and functionality, delivering a crucial service superbly. All of these things people will pay for. But differentiation also means establishing reputation, creating an aura. Take, for instance, tennis shoes. Not just any tennis shoes, Nike tennis shoes. Here is a product that's differentiated by a carefully crafted reputation. This reputation has lent incredible value to the brand and to the logo. In this case, Nike and its swoosh logo and the stable of celebrities that endorse the shoes. Are Nike shoes truly worth up to $200 more than its competitor shoes? Even when there's no really no qualitative difference? The answer is a resounding Yes, the concept of worth has no meaning outside the people who establish worth with their preferences. So those Nike tennis shoes are worth exactly what people are willing to pay for them. Now, even outside the business world, the concept of a differentiation strategy has much to recommend it. In military confrontation, differentiation can win the day. In the latter stages of the Cold War, the United States military saw a renaissance of its strategic core. This change in strategy was the development of a new generation of differentiated technology and weaponry that the Soviets could not imitate. The Soviets were still competing in the era of ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles, manned bombers, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles, the strategic triad. 
The U.S. competed this way as well. Both competed mostly on volume until about 1983 when the Reagan administration announced the Strategic Defense Initiative. This was a radical departure from the previous Cold War military balance, which relied upon the old strategic triad. As Kennedy had done with the program to put a man on the moon, the U.S. consciously chose to utilize its existing advantages in basic scientific research and overall economic output to upend the strategic balance and create new sources of military advantage. While the U.S. public mostly debated whether so-called Star Wars lasers could actually work, just like in the movies, in reality, fixation on any single technology was never the point of strategic defense. Instead, SDI was really a set of advances across an entire spectrum of weapon systems. Advances in stealth technology and miniaturization led to the stealth bomber, the stealth fighter, cruise missile technology, neutron anti-tank weapons, and weaponized laser research. Together, they fundamentally altered the balance of power and accelerated the collapse of the Soviet Union. Development and deployment of new technologies broke the stalemate in the late 1980s, much as it broke the World War I stalemate of trench warfare and the World War II miasma of island hopping in the Pacific. The decision to compete differently in differentiated fashion achieved victory. And that brings us to one of the most difficult tasks in business, figuring out how to differentiate a commodity. It's tough differentiating a commodity, but it's been done successfully in many cases, both well-known and not so well-known. Let's take the commodity product coffee. Coffee. Some people buy their coffee in plain white cans marked with the word coffee. It's a kind of ultimate commoditization. The product has a sameness about it, as does the package. Coffee in a can is a ground-up brown bean. Now, many people don't realize that there are two major kinds of coffee beans, Robusta and Arabica. Robusta beans yield coffee with a bitter taste, but the bean is cheaper and it weathers the elements better at harvest time. Arabica offers a mellow, rich taste, but it's more expensive and it's less hardy in the fields. Now, this difference between Arabica and Robusta beans hasn't proven enough to differentiate coffee in a meaningful way, especially when the folks at Maxwell House and Folgers mix the two types of beans. So here's how you differentiate coffee. Think Starbucks. Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, differentiated coffee not by the product features, but by the way it's served. He created the concept of the Euro-style coffee house in the United States after a trip to Milan, Italy. He pioneered the notion that he could change more, excuse me, charge more for his more expensive Arabica bean coffee by serving it in a unique manner that fed into the notion of lifestyle. Starbucks with its unique and low-key ambiance, became the third place for many people. By this was meant the third place in addition to home and work. Starbucks became a destination, not just a stop-off. By any measure, Starbucks succeeded stupendously following its 1985 debut. But by 2007, Starbucks had seemingly lost its way. With Howard Schultz gone for several years as CEO, Others decided to do what many firms do when the goal of growth overrides all considerations of fundamental strategy. Starbucks decided to change the format of its stores to make it more inviting to other types of customers. In New York, for instance, the idea that hundreds of people were walking by the store every hour beckoned. These people might be enticed into the coffee shop with a wider selection of food and beverage. And so... Deli meats were added to the mix. And the store, once a haven for Euro-style craving young professionals, began to smell like a deli. By switching to a less differentiated strategy, it lost its distinctiveness and it began to lose customers. In effect, it alienated its core customers while making itself more like every other joint on the block. Deli meats? 
Starbucks also missed an even bigger opportunity to deepen its identity in response to the revolution in wireless network access. What Starbucks could and should have done was immediately offer free wireless access to deepen its status as the premier third destination, comparable to home and work. But Starbucks was slow to offer free Wi-Fi, and when it did, it was already trailing behind new competition from McDonald's and Panera Bread in embracing this important technology. Well, Howard Schultz returned as CEO in 2008, and under Schultz's revitalization initiative, Starbucks began to regain its cachet by going back to its roots and refining its unique selling proposition. Now, we've looked at differentiation and we've looked at cost leadership. There's a third path that a person or a business can follow, an offshoot of our two main strategies. And this consists in pursuing a highly targeted market and focusing your resources on serving that tight little segment, whether through cost leadership or through differentiation. And this is called the focus strategy. Focus is exactly what it sounds like. You slice off a narrow spectrum of the market and you focus on that segment. But this is much more than differentiation. Focus is a kind of hyper-differentiation. Here are some examples of firms that follow a focus strategy. Ethnic grocery stores catering to the specific needs of a highly identifiable subsegment of the grocery industry. The producers of ultra-high-end motor cars such as Bentleys which cost upwards of a quarter million dollars each, or Maserati sports cars. These focused companies target the highly specialized needs of a narrow market and fulfill them better than anyone else. One of my favorite examples of a company pursuing a focused strategy is Equal Exchange Coffee, which we looked at in the last lecture. This is the for-profit firm that behaves as if it's a non-profit social conscious operation. Equal Exchange sells coffee, Not just any kind of coffee, but fair trade coffee. And this means that Equal Exchange guarantees that its coffee is produced by farmers who receive a higher than market price for their coffee beans. Now, the best part of this operation is the brilliant business model behind it. You recall that Walmart contracts low-cost suppliers and it passes the savings on to you. Equal Exchange Coffee pays above market prices for its coffee and it passes the expense on to you. Customers who are motivated by social justice causes and have disposable income to spend in that way will gladly pay the higher price. Equal Exchange Coffee has succeeded in increasing the perceived value of its product by linking it to a social justice cause. Consumers receive not only good coffee, but a clear conscience and a warm fuzzy that they're doing good in the world. Equal Exchange has a niche focused strategy that targets a highly specific market with sharply drawn characteristics. This market likely will not grow substantially because of that, but it is a profitable niche, even if they never get on the menu at Starbucks. Another example of a focused strategy was the incredible debut and rise of a soft drink in 1985 called Jolt Cola. Now, this cola was created as a reaction to the increasing health consciousness of Americans. People at the time were reducing caffeine and and sugar intake at the time. Jolt Cola went against this trend. Jolt Cola's motto was all the sugar and twice the caffeine. In retrospect, Jolt was one of the first energy drinks. It clearly positioned itself as a renegade and an alternative to the healthier soft drinks on the market. It targeted young people with a maverick streak. It was a focus strategy with a highly segmented and identifiable market segment. But Jolt, it also lost its way, filing for bankruptcy in 2009 after getting bogged down in overly expensive packaging. Now, how do you differentiate yourself? I hope that you've seen the merit in pursuing a differentiation strategy for yourself as opposed to a low-cost strategy. Now, there is merit in focusing and sharpening yourself as opposed to the all-things-to-all-people approach. This is a major step along the way to developing competitive advantage. We've used that term a lot in this lecture. It means something that you can do better than anyone else, something that is not easily replicable. 
It may not even be a single talent or skill. Instead, it could be a combination of activities that together give you a source of advantage. Now, regardless of the source of your competitive advantage, you must drill down until you discover it and then focus on it relentlessly. You have the advantage of being able to change yourself. And by this, I mean you can specialize. You can aggregate your talents, your skills, your experiences, and you can position yourself accordingly. Your first step is to take stock of your resources and capabilities and assess whether they match your intentions. Do you have what is called strategic fit? This is very much what a company does when it searches for its competitive advantage. You want to discover your own competitive advantage. You want to align your resources and capabilities with your intentions because when you do, you have achieved the best possible circumstances for crafting and successfully executing your strategy. To help you achieve this, I leave you with a task. I want you to develop your own USP, your unique selling proposition. This is another way to think about your core mission. It is your one-sentence description of what you offer people that few others can match. Now think of famous product USPs. Avis, We Try Harder, BMW, The Ultimate Driving Machine. Mercedes-Benz, German Engineering, Bounty, the quicker picker-upper, Folgers, the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Now, to get you started on your own USP, ask yourself a series of questions. What is it I love to do? What am I good at? What category can I own? What word will people associate with me? Now, meet up with a trusted friend who is similarly motivated as you. Interview each other and develop a USP for your friend. Your friend, in turn, develops one for you. Now, this is sometimes the best way of going about your skills inventory. None of the fundamental strategies we've discussed fits every person or situation. And that's why identifying your own fundamental strategy is one of the single most valuable steps you can take. So don't put it off. Do it right now.